My dear friends, so good to see you and be with you in spirit. I'm reminded of the word of Paul where he speaking to the church and said, even though I'm absent with you, I am with you in spirit. So as we are speaking about God's Holy Spirit, I'm with you in spirit because the spirit that dwells in me also dwells in you. And as the spirit is revealing and empowering me to teach you about him so he is living in you revealing the truth that you see as we are united through a common beloved God our Father Christ our Savior and the Holy Spirit who works in us so may this session bless you as we study the work of the Holy Spirit. This lesson is called Union with Christ, Calling and Rebirth. So on page 20, we read Spiritual Union with Christ. This is the foundation of all discussion of the Holy Spirit's work in you, in our lives. He is applying the results and the benefits of Christ's finished work of redemption in the lives of believers and I'm taking my Bible and I'm reading to you out of today's English version out of John chapter 16 and it is the work the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and he says here from verse 7 but I am telling you the truth it is better for you that I go away because if I do not go the Helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, that is the Holy Spirit, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. They are wrong about sin because they do not believe in me. They are wrong about what is right because I am going to the Father and you will not see me anymore. And they are wrong about judgment because the ruler of this world have already been judged. I have so much more to tell you but now it would be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes who reveal the truth about God. He will lead you into all the truth. My friends, this is remarkable. Jesus is when the Spirit comes, referring to the day of Pentecost and our lives being baptized into the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit as we studied last time. That same Spirit that lives in you will lead you into all the truth about God. And he will lead you in all the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth and the truth shall set you free. Can you see the Holy Spirit working in your lives? Setting you free from the bondages of sin. He will not speak of his own authority, but he will speak what he hears. And he will tell you of things to come. Wow, he will tell you, he will warn you, he will convict you. He will be with you as you minister to your people. He will give me glory. That is always the sign of the working of the Spirit. He doesn't glorify a preacher. He doesn't glorify the gifts. He glorified Jesus. Because He will take what I say and He will tell it to you. The words of Jesus as it is recorded by the apostles in the Bible becomes alive as you preach. The Spirit works through you in the lives of the believers and convicting the unbelievers. All that my Father has is mine. And that is why I say that the Spirit will take what I give Him and tell it to you. Remarkable words. The Spirit of Jesus is working with us. Spirit is coming to revive us as was awaited by the apostles for the day of Pentecost. So discussing 
what it means to be in Christ. That is a key theological concept for you to understand. Because Paul talks a lot about being in Christ. An order way that is useful and valuable. Salvation means being united to Christ by the Holy Spirit. In a way that we enter into the union with Christ being analyzed, described by one flesh. It is the work of the Spirit uniting us with Christ. That my friends is one of the most remarkable miracles. Just a week ago, I went into Cape Town to a ministry where they take people off the streets and they disciple them. These drug addicts, prostitute, uh, child trafficking, I mean the worst of the worst criminal people. I've heard a testimony how God changed his life from being a Criminal who should be put to death for all the terrible things he has done in his life. Sharing with joy how Christ has changed his life. That is the work of the Spirit. How God can change lives. How much more can God work in us as believers as we seek him. As we seek his fulfilling of the Spirit blessing us, changing us, transforming us, revealing the scripture to us, taking us from glory to glory. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 to 20 said, You cannot break this union with Christ, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. We are one with him in the Holy Spirit. John 14 verse 20 said, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. What a remarkable event that we will know. The disciples know that Jesus is in the Father. The Hebrew word for God is Elohim, means the Godhead. God. Jesus is in the Father. You are in me and I am in you. A remarkable unity that takes place. Us as human beings are united with Christ. Paul said we are seated at the right hand of the throne with him. So union with Christ. What is the biblical description so that we can understand? Because all these beautiful words are being used in different ways, different contexts and we need to understand them. There is a term called brothers of Christ. Truly I say to you, as you did it to least one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. Want to do something to Jesus? Do it to one of his children. Love them, care for them, nurture them, bless them. We are doing it as if we are doing it to Jesus himself. We are the branches who, with Christ as the vine. John 15 said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. How do we abide in Christ? We are on earth. He is in heaven. But we have the Spirit connecting us with our Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Christ indwells us. John 17, I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. How do we experience the love of Jesus? By loving one another, abiding in Christ, having fellowship. My friends, the church is such a powerful force. We experience Christ's presence. We experience Christ's love through his body. Paul teaches about this union in many ways. Romans chapter 5 verse 8, he said, Christ died for us. We are united with Christ. 
Galatians 2 verse 20, crucified with him. We lay down our old life as if we were crucified with Christ. We are buried with him. We lay down the old life. We are raised and sealed with him. Ephesians chapter 2. We are hidden in Christ. Colossians 3 verse 3. He keeps us secure. We will appear with him in glory. On page 21. In him. Paul frequently uses the phrase. In fact he uses it 160 times in the New Testament. Synonym for being a Christian. We are in Christ. We are called Christians. Christ. Can you see the word? Christian means little Christ. We are Christ the representative. He dwells in us. We are not the Savior, but the Savior dwells in us through the Spirit. So we are in Christ before me. Romans 16 verse 7. So remember, we were in Adam before we came to Christ. The sinful nature dominate us. And now we are in Christ. We have been transformed. Romans chapter 5. So we are walking in the new covenant. The old covenant, now the new covenant. that was inaugurated by Christ himself the night before he was crucified. This is my covenant. Our union with Christ has its origin in God's eternal purposes. We were chosen in Christ before the foundations of the world. Ephesians, let us read that on page 2. 21, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him my friends you and I know we, we're not holy we all tend to sin even our thought patterns are sinful but God doesn't look to us he sees Christ the spirit dwells in us and he sanctifies us praise God so we are holy before him we are joined to Christ before we were born. This is beyond our full understanding. To be in Christ becomes the defining principle of the Christian life. There is no aspect of Christian experience outside of it. The implications of our union with Christ. What does it mean for you for our lives right now? We must learn to look to rely on nothing else but Christ for salvation salvation and sanctification why because all our salvation is ours only as we believe into christ and are united with him we cannot separate any aspect of the christian life and salvation from christ he is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end he is our beginning of our spiritual journey and he will be with us in glory while we are influenced by our past life all those baggage we will all those sinful nature that sometimes jump up in our lives is simply a fact that our lives now are no longer bound and constrained by our past we are no longer slaves to sin sin no longer rules our lives but Christ is our King is our God is our Savior and he dwells in us through his spirit. There has been a fundamental remaking of our being. Have you experienced that? Being transformed, drawing closer and closer to God. I am alive because Christ lives in me. Paul said in Galatians, I am being crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ grants our union to him in his incarnation. He became a man like one of us in order to redeem us and take us to glory. Our union with Christ is not transforming into deity, we don't become divine. We don't become gods. No. We are 
becoming more like Christ, transformed into His image. This is not mysticism without rational content. It's not syncretism. You cannot combine mystic religion or animism with Christianity or Hinduism combined it. No, the old life has passed. The old religion has been repented from, changed, completely made new. Rather, it's a transformational work out in us, transforming into the image of God. It is expressed in Christ's humanity, making us more truly and fully human. The benefits which Christ gave us can never be separ separated from the benefactor, the giver, the giver, the life giver. So our gospel must be Christ-centered. Always remember who we are, who we belong to in Christ. The work of the Spirit in us is then unfolding, increasingly transforming into the likeness of Christ. He is making us more like Jesus. God is producing in His people true humanity after Christ as the first of the new humanity. The calling from God. How are we can we describe being united with Christ? What does the Holy Spirit do and how does the Bible describe it? Biblical passages, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, called into the fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us just look at these two verses. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 says, To the church of God, which is in Corinth, or wherever you are, which are in Pokhara, which are in Kinshasa, which are in Nairobi, wherever you are, you are the Church of God, to all who are called to be God's holy people. You are called to be God's holy people, who belong to Him, how? In union with Christ, together with all people everywhere who worship our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. We are united through a common calling. Verse 9 said, God is to be trusted. The God who called you to have fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We have fellowship with Christ through the Holy Spirit. We are united with God's holy people through the Spirit. The Spirit combines us, he works with us, He combines us as believers. And unite us with Christ. What a marvelous God, the Spirit we have. Calling is, mean, be, uh, is the means of bringing us into union with Christ. And the beginning of the process of making us like Christ. We will have a whole session on the process called sanctification. So here we have a picture. God's eternal predestination. Beautiful long word which can be theological described in many books. What does it mean? It means that God knows before the foundation of the world who will be saved. He calls us. He calls us to glorification. So how are people called? Verbally, by means of God's word. The power of preaching. The general call, this is the verbal summons issued throughout the earth to all the people. It is a general outward call of God to repentance through the proclamation of the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make people my disciples. This is the work of evangelism in all its forms. The call goes out, but we do not know who will respond in faith. Will this person be responding? God knows, but we do not know. That is the predestination. God knows who will uh, respond. We do not know, but everyone is invited. That is the mystery. We do not know how they will respond. We are born with a free choice. Everyone can choose. But trust God that at least they will have the opportunity to hear the gospel. So the inward call, people respond to the summoned to repent and believe. The effectual call is the inward call 
that actually brings people into the fellowship of God. This is the work of the Spirit, as we will see next. The Spirit convicts of sin, righteousness and judgment. But God will never overrule your will. This is the inward secret work of the regeneration by the Holy Spirit, creating spiritual life where there is previously only death. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel when I say, you must be born again. The regenerational work, the new birth, is entirely the work of God's Spirit. The Spirit changes a person's inclination, desires towards God, creating saving faith. The moment you respond, God gives you the faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's a gift of God. If you respond to the call of God, God gives you the gift of faith. That is the response. How he responds, only God knows. God knows who are his and who will respond to him. What is the source and the implication of calling? The Father calls us into the fellowship with Christ. Here you can see many uh, parables. One of them is the wedding feast. There is no gap between the Father and the Son in the redemption. There is no tension between the work. The Son is not manipulating the Father or the Spirit manipulating the Son or the Father. No, they are working in unity. Our gospel proclamation must mirror the Father's approach. God wants sinners to come to Him. He is for us. He is not against us. He is for you, for your church, for your family, for your nation, for your tribe. He is for you. God is for you. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you look in the mirror, say to yourself, God is for you. God is with you. God is empowering you. God is with you. Live life worthy of your calling. Live life worthy of your calling. God called you. Reflect the calling. Live a life worthy. That is the walk the work of sanctification. We must live life as faithful Christians, as committed followers of Christ, constant with what we profess and what we believe, in line with our calling as God's children. If God has converted us from paganism to Christ, then we must live that way. We are Christians. We must live like Christians. We are called into God's kingdom and glory. We must live as heirs. We inherit the kingdom of God. We must live as heirs of the kingdom. The rebirth. See the picture there? On the top of page 24. Result of sin. We were disinherited. We were polluted. Disingrated. Death. But our union with Christ. We are adopted. We are not Jewish people. We are heathen. Pagans. Outside the Jewish nation, so we are adopted. Holiness, sanctification, glorification and new life. So the language of rebirth in the Bible, the, the word regeneration is used twice, Matthew 19 verse 28 and Titus 3 verse 5. It refers to the new birth. Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put in you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. The promise of God. That means when he put us, his spirit in us, we are born again. We are born from above. James said, brought us forth. Peter said, born again. Two, uh, 1 Peter 2 verse 2 said, new Christians as a spiritual babe. Paul uses born of God. So the scripture emphasizes that regeneration is the sovereign work of God alone. Only God can change us. So why is rebirth and regeneration needed? Do not marvel when I say you must be born again. This is not just for Nicodemus but all people. We need to be born 
because we belong to the kingdom of darkness and we are born into the kingdom of God by committing our lives to Christ our Savior, accepting his sacrificial death on the cross, being justified by God through faith and then we are born into the body of Christ and we receive the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of life only comes by God's spirit. Grounded in man's fallen condition, men cannot see God's kingdom without being born or regenerated. 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says, No one can hear God's call until the Holy Spirit opens his heart and ears to see. Ephesians talk, we were dead in our trespasses, but God made them alive. So what is this? This is the gift of new birth given on the basis of our faith. It is so that we might have faith. No one can believe without a regenerating heart. Notice that Jesus then moves out and speaks that we need for faith after being born again, again. So the character of rebirth and regeneration, what is involved in it? Rebirth and regeneration is both spiritual and mysterious. Spiritual regeneration originate in the spirit and bring us into communion with the spirit. Born from above. Born in the spirit. Mysterious. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, it is like the wind. You can hear it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it's beneath our conscience, beyond our ability to analyze because it's from a divine dimension and we in our human capacity cannot really grasp it. So we cannot identify the precise moment of rebirth or regeneration. So have no immediate access to what the spirit does in regeneration, but only visible evidence of repentance and faith. It's a beautiful saying which I want to read to you uh, from Grudem. The reason that evangelicals often think that regeneration comes after saving faith is that they see the results after people come to faith and they think that regeneration must therefore have come after saving faith. Yet, here we must decide on the basis of what scripture tells us because regeneration itself is not something we seek or know about directly. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sounds, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What does re uh, rebirth or regeneration accomplish? It accomplishes a new heart. The promise of the new covenant. I will give you a new heart to fix the whole person. It repairs all the damages of the sin and the fall. So there's three elements of men affected by rebirth and regeneration. It's the mind, the will and the heart. So first of all the mind is illuminated, can see the kingdom of God. Hebrews said we must be transformed in our minds. Uh, uh, Romans 12 verse 1 and 2. So the kingdom of God comes to our mind. Our, the laws is written in our minds. We, our minds is regenerated by the spirit. New view of God's truth. Our spiritual eyes is open. We are born again. God's spirit is planted in us. It liberates the will from spiritual bondage. Man's will cannot come to the light. Rebirth takes place and your will is changed. You no longer want to do sin, but you want to please God. It cleanses our hearts. Born of the water, so talks about the spirit being reborn into us, giving us new birth. So my friends, there's some questions, review questions, there's 10 questions some time for you to go through them in your class, in your small groups, just go in small groups and go through them 
and just talk to one another. Some of these concepts may be confusing, some of them might need to explain some of the scriptures you want to re read them, make sure you understand them properly and talk to your teacher about if there's something you don't understand. Our next lesson will be on faith and repentance. God bless you.